Okay, hi guys. Um, Steve, thank you for that introduction. Uh, no pressure, right? Saying that I'm one of the best at explaining the steps. So, no worries. Um, so, my name's James. I'm also a recovered alcoholic. I like to say that um, because my literature that I use, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a little study edition here. It tells me that um, that I can recover from a hopeless state of mind and body. So uh, I have no problem saying that. doesn't mean I'm cured, of course. Um, if that were the case, I probably wouldn't be here trying to explain step one to you. Um, and I probably wouldn't have gone over step one with a new sponsee like two days ago like I did. Um, but I, I have recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body as a direct result of working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So one of my favorite things to do, and, I, and I'm not just saying this, it's something I really enjoy is, is to take other people through this. Um, number one, because it saved my life, um, literally saved my life. And, and number two, it's become um, a, a real joy to, to do, simply because when when I when I'm able to take somebody else through this that's suffering from the same disease that I am, and I get to see the light start to come on for them, them to make some realizations about themselves, maybe that they don't want to make, but hopefully they're desperate enough and at the point where they can make these admissions. Um, it, it just there's nothing else like it. I, I tell people quite a bit that when I take somebody through these steps, it's one of the few things I do that I feel is real. <laughs> I mean that because there's a lot of my life that, you know, you're not sure about and that you, uh, you know, maybe I'm making most of my life up as I go along. But when I do this, it's something very real to me uh, in a way that few things are. So I appreciate you guys um, coming, coming out to hear me talk about step one. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a little PowerPoint. Just it, it, it's something simple, but maybe it'll help follow along. Mostly I'm going to work out of the book because. That's how I was taught. That's what's worked for me. And um, so far, it's what's worked for others I've taken through that have the proper attitude and, and work at it. Um, let me share the screen here. I think we want this one. Can you guys see that? Okay, cool. So, step one here. This is just a step one. If you want to list the steps, you can find it, find it on page 59 in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But um, this is the first step. We admitted that we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. So, I mean, the big thing for me, you know, a little background, I, I spent my, my, my first step into uh, alcoholism which is kind of funny is I was drunk, very drunk. And I, I was trying to jump from one roof to the next, to the next roof. And I uh, broke my arm pretty bad. I, I broke my pelvis. And that was the beginning really of my alcoholic journey. That's the, the sad and in some ways hilarious truth is that's kind of how it really started for me. Um, I got way worse after that. Um, and it was a gradual thing. I, I suppose I had fun in the beginning. But eventually, uh, I just couldn't stop drinking. And despite the fact that I could barely hold down jobs, um, all my relationships were terrible, if they even existed at all, despite the fact that I was stealing from people and ended up homeless, I, I couldn't stop. Um, and the rehab that Steve mentioned that I ended up at, Diablo Valley Ranch, you might hear a few people talk about that. Um, when I got there, I was introduced to these steps. Uh, and ultimately, that's what ended up saving my life. I won't go too much into the details of my, my own story, because I'm sure that any of you who identify as an alcoholic like, like I do probably have a very similar story. Um, the key points being there that I just, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what and I could not for the life of me stop. Um, and that was something that, that, you know, really was, was taking my life from me. The first thing I learned, the first thing we went over when I, when I 
got to rehab, they give you a lot of things. They, they tell you about triggers and all these things. But, but, but what really held weight with me and interested me was a group of guys who were going over these steps. Uh, and they did a book study every week. And I think the main reason was because they clearly were like me in a very real way. And yet, here they were smiling and offering their time and helping everybody else out um, and having a good time doing it. And, uh, you know, a lot of these gentlemen had been free of alcohol for 20 years or more. And to me, that seemed almost unbelievable. So when they spoke, I listened. Um, I was desperate enough to at that point. The first step, they told me, was that we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. And that sounds well and good. I, th I think the, the main thing I got from step one, the main thing we're talking about here is I knew something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what. I didn't know what my problem was. Um, so step one, I think, is really about identifying the problem. And within there, there's a little bit of um, a hint of a possible solution um, that they talk about in the doctor's opinion. Uh, but mainly we're trying to find out, okay, so if I want to admit something, I have to know why I'm admitting it, right? If I want to say I'm an alcoholic, like I do, I did in the beginning of, of, of this meeting, I want to know why. It's not enough for me, um, you know, everybody called me an alcoholic for a long time. <laughs> and it's not that I disagreed after so many years of, of acting like one, but I didn't know what that meant. A huge revolution uh, to me was learning about step one and understanding what my problem was. So there's two parts to step one, really. Um, one is an admission of powerlessness um, over alcohol. Not people, places, and things, which you hear in the rooms a lot, because um, that's not necessarily true. But when it comes to alcohol or, or drugs or any mind-altering substance, in general, I, I lost the power of choice. The second part of step two, or I'm sorry, step one, is that our lives have become unmanageable. So if I'm going to do step one, I need to understand both of those parts. And to do that, we're going to talk about a few, few kind of key things that the book speaks of. Um, one is the mental obsession. The other is the physical allergy. Um, and from the physical allergy comes the phenomenon of craving. Um, those two things lead to a powerlessness um, because... They set about the cycle of drinking for me, a cycle that I can't get out of, and that makes my life unmanageable. So if you guys have a book, or, or I'll just read if you don't, if you're driving or doing something, um, I usually start step one on page 30. Um, and it says, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. So here we see um, our first mention, maybe not in the book, but um, one of the first mentions of the mental obsession, right? So... I'll give you an example from my own life. I, I just, I remember my brother talking to me in, in, in concern and saying, you know, when are you going to stop this? And I told him, I was like, no, you just don't understand. I just, I need to cut back on it. Right. Like, okay, maybe I, I go a little crazy sometimes, but I just need to, you know, maybe not do it so much. I get it. I'm, I'm a little off the rails. And there were many moments like that where I was had this obsession that I could still drink, even though it was painfully clear to really, if I looked at myself to me, but also everybody else around me, that maybe I could. Um, the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death or into rehab, if we're lucky. Um, but unfortunately, many of us uh, die of this, this disease before we get the opportunity to um, work a possible solution. 
So we have a mention of the mental obsession. And uh, the key point from page 30 being that the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker, which I just went over. Um, so when I'm taking a sponsee through that, I typically go over to page 20. We'll hop around the book a little bit just to get some key points. Um, but I usually go over to page 20 so that we could talk about the three types of drinkers. Because the main point, once again, of step one is to identify the problem so that I can identify as an alcoholic. And then, you know, if I, once I do that, maybe I look at a possible solution for my problem. So at the top of page 20, you may already have asked yourself why it is that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless, you're curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. And whenever I see mind and body in this text, I, I tend to think now of the mental obsession and the physical allergy that we were talking about. If you were an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. I should tell you what we have done. But before going into a detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize uh, some points as we see them. How many times have people said to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can, can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Just lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. Or she's such a sweet girl, I should think he'd stop for her sake. I had sweet girls before. I had some that I really loved and, um, you know, were very close to me. It didn't stop me. In fact, none of these things stopped me. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. So here we're taking a look at some of the many things that have been said to us, right? Um, and, and even maybe we've said to ourselves, right? Like, why can't I do this? Well, I'm going to stop for my family. I have a lot of sponsees who, who, who are trying to get their families back and they're going to stop for their kids or their wife. Um, and the truth is for a real alcoholic, those reasons don't matter or they, they don't have any real effect. Um, and we're going to discuss why. When I'm taking a sponsee through this, I always bring them to these three types of drinkers here. The book describes the moderate drinker, the hard drinker, um, and the real alcoholic. The question is, which one are you? Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair himself physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time, but if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So, being that step one is about admitting powerlessness and that our lives have become unmanageable, once again, we have to identify as the type of, the, the alcoholic of the hopeless variety that this book describes. And this is a good kind of breakdown of the, the types of drinkers so that somebody can read this and try to identify. Um, the key differences between these three, right, it has to do with reason, right, or thinking. A moderate drinker just needs a good reason. And I mean, that could be anything. You know, maybe somebody gets mad at me enough because I acted a fool when I was drinking. So maybe I'm going to stop or moderate. The hard drinker is maybe a little more serious. 
and uh, there's some this person requires a strong reason to quit drinking and there are some examples given maybe a health warning uh, maybe they they fell in love um, they change their environment right we call it doing ge a geographical right I'm gonna move to a different place um, but they can stop or moderate right even though it may be more difficult than with the moderate drinker so they just need a strong reason the real alcoholic it's funny because the paragraph describing them doesn't use the word reason at all. It just says they begin to lose all control. So there's a huge difference between a real alcoholic and the moderate or hard drinker. Um, the moderate or hard drinker can respond to reason. Their thinking when it comes to alcohol isn't entirely insane yet, right? Um, but a real alcoholic like me, reason has nothing to do with it. It just has nothing to do with it for me. I, I couldn't stop, and, and none of those reasons mentioned ever came into my mind when it, when it mattered. None of those reasons popped into my head when it came time to not pick up a drink. <laughs> the answer was always to pick up the drink. In fact, some of those reasons seemed to motivate me to pick up even more. Um, but if you're a real alcoholic, you don't have control and reason has nothing to do with your ability to stop drinking or to continue drinking. Reason has nothing to do with it. Um, and we spoke about the mental obsession. Well, that's kind of why here, because the mental obsession is in the mind, right? And that's also where reason is, our thinking. So if you have those two things occupying your mind, with an alcoholic, the mental obsession to drink is probably going to win out. Here's the fellow who has been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's a Dr. Jekyll, a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world. Yet let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. Uh, me personally, at the end of my drinking career, I only socialize with people to get money from them or to get drugs or alcohol from them. Otherwise, I was by myself. So I, I would consider that pretty dangerously antisocial. He has a positive genius for getting right or tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor, but in that respect, he is incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes, and has a promising career ahead of him. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself, and then pulls the structure down on his head with a senseless series of sprees. He is the fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated, he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early the next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. Once again, me, me personally, I could not ever keep enough alcohol around to store it anywhere. It was always gone. I made plans to save stuff till the next day. It never worked out that way for me. Um, that's pretty cool. People managed to do it though. As matters grew worse, he begins to use a combination of high powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves uh, so he can go to work. I didn't have a job. So that, at the end there, um, then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor or gives him morphine or some sedative, or in my case, some methadone, some suboxone, maybe. Um, with which to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. So when I'm reading this, it, it, it makes me laugh at how many of these boxes I check off. Um, and that's what happened to me when I first went through this book and when I went through step one was how much I identified as an alcoholic in so many ways. Um, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing um, sums up me pretty well personally uh because i still say this to this day i have some old high school friends 
um, I haven't talked to since high school, and they probably wouldn't believe you if I if if you were to tell them that I was a serious alcoholic and had to attend a rehab and and you know had destroyed my life. They probably wouldn't believe you, um, because I seemed normal besides this this disease, right? With all other concerns, I seemed fairly normal. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic, as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters. So I love when this book asks me questions because it's, it's, it's important to question things. This book and the solution encourages you to think. Um, and when I was new to this, that all these questions I thought were very good. So why do I do this? What the hell? Why is, what is my problem? Why can't I stop? Why can't I stop? Why can't I just walk away or drink like somebody else, like just a normal person? I had so many friends. I had girlfriends who even drank a lot and did drugs with me, and yet they were able to walk away. And I remember it happening on several occasions, and in my gut, I had one, one of them tell me, I don't want to do this anymore. I never have any money. This is all I do. I want to move on with my life. I want to have a life. And I remember just in my gut knowing that I wasn't like her and that I wasn't going to be able to walk away from this like she could. It was a pretty humbling experience. Not humbling enough for me to stop, of course. I needed a lot more uh, damage done. So let's hop over to, um, since we're asking all these questions, right? Let's hop over to doctor's opinion, which for step one is very key and has um, a lot of answers, I think, in it. Uh, if you have the third edition of the big book, it's page, what is that, 26, XXVI. Um, in the fourth edition, it's XXVIII, um, 28. So at the top, it says, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. So the first thing we mentioned here is that physical allergy that we talked about in the beginning. This is the main thing that makes me an alcoholic. People can have mental obsessions about a lot of things, maybe not to the, uh, to the extent that I have a mental obsession with alcohol, but people can obsess about a lot of things. But not everybody has a physical component, um, something about them that makes them not react to something the same way as other people. Not everybody has that. A true alcoholic has this physical allergy. And you guys, you know, the experienced members here are probably very familiar with Dr. Silkworth. But just a quick background. Um, this is, you know, at the time, probably the world's foremost expert on alcoholism. Um, and science hadn't quite caught up with what this book and fellow alcoholics along with Dr. Silkworth were theorizing and that that was this physical allergy um so it was pretty groundbreaking at the time now since then I, I'm a um, budding scientist myself I'm going to school for um, molecular biology or, or biochemistry um science has since caught up with this and um we now know that, that biochemically, uh, this is something that seems to be, be very true for alcoholics and addicts. Um, specifically in the brain, we don't react the same way as other people to drugs and alcohol. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving which is another term we talked about in the beginning quickly, is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. 
These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. So, well, I'm gonna keep reading. Anyway, I'll just keep reading here. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. So, like I mentioned before, there's a possible solution to this problem we have that we can't stop drinking. Um, but that's more, um, we'll get into step two or three, two and three to talk about that in more detail. Um, I'd like to jump down to the bottom paragraph here. Um, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. I would agree with that. I would say I like the effect produced by alcohol maybe more than most. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they has, have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of recovery. So this paragraph is one of my favorite paragraphs in the book because, uh, especially when relating to step one, because it, it kind of hits all the boxes here. Um, he's already mentioned the physical allergy and the phenomenon of craving that's activated once we set off the physical allergy, right? So I don't necessarily have that phenomenon of craving until I take a drink into my body. Um, the physical allergy is then activated and I, I crave alcohol in a way that a normal person doesn't. Um, which seems simple enough, because if I understand that about myself, I should be able to stop. Um, that's where the mental obsession comes in. And, and he mentions that in this paragraph as well. Um, unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at, ta at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. So that's the mental obsession, again, that we mentioned on page 30. Um, yeah. I, I see other people drinking, uh, and in the back of my mind, I after a certain amount of time, if I'm able to get any separation from alcohol at all, I'm going to start to think that maybe I made a big deal about it and I should be fine. Um, Sometimes I don't think at all, and the book mentions that. Sometimes no thought crosses my mind and I just pick up a bottle. But the, the point is that mental obsession means that I'm going to probably drink again, which means I'll trigger, trigger the physical allergy. And that phenomenon of craving will doom me to continually use and drink until the wheels fall off. And even when the wheels fall off, I'm probably sliding down the freeway, you know, on metal on metal, shooting sparks everywhere. And he says, also, he mentions in here, um, a possible solution, right, of breaking the cycle. And he talks about the psychic change. Um, and 1930s speak, right, the definition of psychic wasn't maybe the way we think of it now. We're not talking about like a medium or somebody who um, is going to tell my my future or something um but psychic the word psychic is related to the soul or mind right so he's he's talking about a psychic change we learn later that that's another word for the spiritual experience or spiritual awakening that the solution in this book is designed to provide in order to remove that mental obsession 
and the spiritual malady. On page 64, it says that when I straighten out spiritually, or, or when I'm, yeah, let me just get the quote so I don't mess it up. Uh, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically, right? So in other words, um, if I can find a, a psychic change, if I can find a spiritual experience that remove, that'll straighten me out mentally, which is the mental obsession will be removed. And physically, I'm going to recover because I'm not going to be putting alcohol into my body if I can remove that mental obsession. So, at the bottom of this, um, on page uh, 25, 6, 7, 27, the bottom paragraph says, I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I've had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all of their interests so that the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. Now, um, this is an illustration of the cycle of drinking from the book. It's not perfect because it's missing a little spot right in between taking a drink and using a drug and the phenomenon of craving, and that's uh, that's the physical allergy. But I couldn't find one that was, you know, I was too lazy to make one myself, and this one's pretty good. It's just missing a little piece there. But this is what Silkworth describes, too, and it, and it touches all the bases of step one. So let's say, I don't know, I would go on a binge or something, right? I'm drinking. You can start anywhere on this cycle because it's a circle, and a circle doesn't have a beginning or end. But let's start at a binge or bender, right? The book also calls it a spree. So I'm drinking, and I, I just can't stop. I start to get consequences. As a result of those consequences, I have some remorse or guilt. Eventually, it's bad enough to where I make a firm resolution to stop. All right? I'm not going to do this anymore. This is crazy. What am I doing? Um, and then... The problem here is that I still have untreated alcoholism, right? I still have an alcoholic mind. And that mental obsession, if I'm untreated, comes back. Somewhere along the line, whether I think I, I can, I actually have some thought behind it, or I don't have any thought and I just pick up a bottle, I'm, going, I'm doomed to use again and to drink again. Once I do that, because I have this physical allergy, that phenomenon of craving will be activated again, and I'm going to go on another spree, a binge or a bender. And that cycle will continue until I die of this disease, take my own life, or end up in jail or uh, another rehab. So if I want to identify as an alcoholic, it's important for me to understand all these things. It's, it's critical. I have to understand, and it has to get through my thick skull, that I'm doomed to drink as a result of this disease. Question is, can we get out of this cycle? Well, of course we can. I wouldn't be here if, I, if we couldn't get out of this. Um, the book provides a very, very effective, practical, and spiritual solution to this problem that I have. But for now, in step one, we're just identifying this problem. Physical allergy means that I can't drink like normal people because I'll develop the phenomenon of craving and I won't be able to stop. The mental obsession means that I'm doomed to drink despite the fact that I may know that I can't drink like other people. It doesn't matter. I can give a pretty good example. Um, I like to use this one a lot. Um, because it was, it's just a very clear example of, of that mental obsession, right? Really being the root of the problem for me because that's what ultimately tells me I can drink when I know I can't. Um, I had been on a spree of bender for a while. I worked at um, a bank. 
I had enough money to, to nurse my sprees and to support, um, all the drinking. Um, I had a girlfriend who I really loved. I, we had a great relationship at one point, although that was teetering on the brink because of my drinking. Um, I made a firm resolution to stop and I meant it. I really wanted to quit and she believed me too. So she said, well, I'm going to help you. And she stayed with me for, I forget how many days, um, basically to nurse me back to health while I went through withdrawal symptoms and everything. Um, and I, I'll never forget this. It was Monday, the sun was shining and I woke up and physically I felt fine. Um, I felt good. In fact, Right there, th that physical allergy wasn't the ph phenomenal craving wasn't activated by the physical allergy at this point. I had removed alcohol and drugs from my system. Sun was shining. I had a good job I was going to, so I, I put on my suit, um, got into my car, and I was happy. I was going to go to work. And I had this beautiful woman who loved me. Everything was going to be fine. All it took was a, a quick call from a friend of mine. Right. And I'll never forget this. It was as if the car was driving itself and I went straight to his house to drink before work. And here's the thing. I vaguely in the back of my head, there was kind of this tiny, barely there voice that was telling me, what the fuck are you doing? Right. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And it was this panicky little feeling. I went straight there. Um, I went straight there. I was late for work, obviously. Um, one of the many, many, many times I've been late for work. Um, and I just think that's a, a, a good example of my problem. Um, specifically that mental obsession. Because the mental obsession means I can't stop picking up a drink. And then once I drink, the physical allergy is act activated. The phenomenon of craving develops. And I'm stuck in the cycle of drinking, which makes my life unmanageable. And we talk about that a little bit more on page 23. So at the top of 23, these observations, and the observation is basically that um, once I drink, I can't stop, right? So we're talking about the physical allergy and the phenomenon of craving there. So these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting this terrible cycle in motion, so the cycle of drinking. Therefore, the main problem with alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. If you ask him why he started on that last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of a 100 alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of the man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so that he can't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. Once in a while, he may tell the truth, and the truth, strange to say, is usually that he has no more idea why he took that first drink than you have. And especially later in my drinking career, I found that to be true. And the example I just gave, it was true like that. Like I knew I was, I was fucking up. I knew I was making a mistake, but I didn't know why I couldn't stop making that mistake. It was just this compulsion, this mental obsession. Some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts they really do not know why they do it. Once this malady has a real hold, they are baffled. They are a baffled lot. There is an obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal. But everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. I wish I wish I had that. I I thought uh, till the very end of my drinking career, I I really thought that I would just kind of snap out of it at some point. I really did. Um, I didn't even know what that meant, but I really thought I would snap out of it. 
The tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost all control. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. This tragic situation has already arrived in practically every case long before it is suspected. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable, at certain times, to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. I, this is a beautiful summary of what we've been talking about. Why am I powerless? I'm a powerless because I have a physical allergy that means I can't stop drinking once I start. And I have this mental obsession that means I can't stop picking up a drink, even though I know what's going to happen. I end up in the cycle of drinking, and my life is unmanageable. The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts do occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time. Here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. That, that was my case toward the uh, end of my drinking career quite a bit. I didn't much think anymore. I think because I knew it was useless. How often have some of us begin to drink in this nonchalant way, and after the third or fourth, pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink, or what's the use anyhow? When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with an alcoholic tendency, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid and then less locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions. And by, by the way, in case you, you're wondering, legion, like the Roman legion, it means a thousand. So we're talking thousands of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. So many want to stop but cannot. So, the very next sentence says there is a solution, which is beautiful because I was very happy to learn that. Um, and that solution is the aforementioned psychic change as a result of working the steps of Alcoholic and, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Specifically, in my experience, it's been steps four through nine. Um, but, so now, if we're taking step one, we know perhaps a lot more about our condition and our problem. And for me, that helped me to be able to admit that I was powerless. Because I didn't want to admit anything. I don't know about any of you guys, but I'm, I'm somebody who feels like they're a relatively capable person. And, you know, most things in my life, um, if I had any other problem, I was able to figure it out um, and, you know, just try hard enough and I could get over that problem. This is the first time in my life when nothing I could do was going to fix this problem before me and nothing anyone else around me did was going to fix it either. And that's true powerlessness. In step one, I at least finally come to understand why I'm powerless, why my life is unmanageable. I'm powerless because, once again, I'm bodily different from my fellows. I have a physical allergy that means I don't react to alcohol the same way as others. And when I do, I start to crave it like a normal person doesn't. 
I have a mental obsession that dooms me to drink despite that, despite that knowledge, despite that allergy. It's going to compel me to drink. Once I do that, I'm stuck in that cycle again and my life is unmanageable because nothing else matters but the next drink when I'm in that cycle. So if you go to page 30, we're back where we started for step one. On the second paragraph down, it says, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. So, concede is basically another word for admit, right? Uh, admit that something is true or valid after first denying or resisting it. And I think that sums up my relationship with the disease of alcoholism pretty well. Um, it can also mean surrender or yield. Um, so right here, I always tell sponsees, the, I think some of these words, I do believe that they're probably divinely inspired. And I also think that they're very specific. Um, fully concede to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. So I always make this clear to a sponsee as it was made to me when I took this first step. This isn't for my wife or my significant other. I'm not conceding for the courts. I'm not conceding, you know, for my parole officer. This has to be done for me to my innermost self. Which incidentally, we find out later, that's also where God resides, which is interesting to me. but. That's another step. But it has to be a full concession, a full admission that I am an alcoholic as described in this book. No more resisting. We have to cease fighting anything or anyone and make an admission that I am this. If I don't understand the problem, I can't seek a solution. So, step one do I understand this problem? Okay, am I one? All right, well, let's get to a solution. And uh, I don't know how much time I took, but um, but that's it for me, guys.